Thank you.
Welcome. No, ojalá. Yo coso. Welcome. Bienvenido. Es Cabo. Hola, seja muito bem-vindo a HIF. Hey, good morning. Well, it's probably not morning where you are now, but wherever you are, welcome to HIF Online, another edition. Today, Pastor Jason will be speaking on Caring Family in this series that we've been doing called Together, in which uh, we're looking at the healthy habits of a caring community. Well, speaking of caring community, we have a family celebration today. Ryan, why don't you come and tell us about it? You just finished your Master's of Practical Theology. Yes, indeed. I finished, uh, what, August 15th was my final grade and final class. And so I graduated uh, out of Regent University in Virginia in the United States. And it has been a three-year journey that is now finished. Now, is there a special class that you took or maybe an idea that like, wow, this is really mind-blowing that, that you learned getting your master's? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I had a lot of leadership classes and the whole premise was practical theology. So theology that you can apply right away with people, with discipleship. And uh, yeah, in some of my leadership classes, I really kind of latched on to the idea of discipleship through listening mm -hmm. and how that has really transformed how I work with the youth, really what Alpha is all about. And so it's kind of paired with what I'm already doing really, really well. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you have these classes in leadership because Ryan's now helping me teach the Equip Leadership Workshop, which we having one come up in September. You know, HIF is a church that wants to be your family while you're here in, Ano in Hanoi. You, uh, you may be missing your family, but we want to be your church family. And so together we are here to worship God. I hope you're in a community where you're watching together, maybe a group of friends, maybe a, an adopted family that you're getting together in somebody's living room and watching online. And uh, we're here to worship God today. Thank you for being with us. Good morning, church. Happy Sunday to everyone. I'm glad that we could all worship together today, even just online. I'd like to invite everyone to stand and let's just declare our praises to God this morning. And let's declare that Christ is enough. Amen. Christ is my reward. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy.
meeting 2020 starts September 15th and I want to invite you to invite someone to Alpha. What Alpha consists of is free food, a welcoming environment, friendship building, and honest conversations about life's big questions and the basics of Christianity. Those are the parts that make up Alpha, but what Alpha is, what Alpha really is, is a space to experience Jesus, his amazing, overflowing love. This is why we love Alpha. This is why we invite our friends and our family and coworkers so that they could experience Jesus' love. So what can you do to be a part of sharing Jesus' love through Alpha? Pray who God might have you invite. Invite someone and even go with them to Alpha. You are more than welcome. You can volunteer to be a leader. And lastly, pray for our guests that they could come, that they'd be available on a Tuesday night, and pray for our leaders that they would live a life of integrity and patience with our guests. So if you want more information or register for Alpha or volunteer, visit our webpage at hif.vn alpha. will bow down and every chain will bring his broken hearts declare his praise who can stop the Lord Almighty our God is the Lion the Lion of Judah he's roaring with power and fighting
Good morning, dear church. We are going to pray together, but my name is Hardwick, and I've been um, a member of HIA for the past two years. Mm -hmm. Before we go to prayer, mm -hmm. we are going to read from the book of First John, chapter 5, mm -hmm. from verse 14. First John, chapter 5, from verse 14. And I'm going to read, we have courage in God's presence because we are sure that he hears us if we ask him for anything that is according to his will. Verse 15, he hears us whenever we ask him. And since we know this is true, we know also that he gives us what he asks from him. So church, let us pray together. Mm -hmm. Almighty Father, we approach your throne of grace this morning to thank you. Mm -hmm. We want to worship you and adore you mm -hmm. because you are our God. You are the sustainer of our lives. Mm -hmm. We thank you, dear Father, because you provide us our needs mm -hmm. and we also know that you restore our lives each and every day. We thank you for another beautiful day that you have given us. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, dear Father, that you have given us this privilege to come before your throne of grace. Mm -hmm. We want to start by confessing our sins before you because we know that in one way or the other, we have sinned against you. Mm -hmm. We have sinned either as individuals we have also seen either as families and even as a church, dear Father, mm. we want to ask for your forgiveness. As you tell us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 13, mm -hmm. that he who conceals his sins does not prosper. Yes. 
but the one who confesses and abandons his sins, dear Father, is going to find mercy from you. Mm. And so, dear Father, we want to seek your throne of grace mm. to ask for your forgiveness of the sins that we have committed against you. Mm-hmm. We thank you, dear Father, that we have come today in church to worship you mm-hmm. as a family of believers. Mm-hmm. We want to thank you, dear Father, for sustaining our church. Mm-hmm. We want to thank you for the leadership of this church. Mm-hmm. We pray, dear Father, for all the pastors of this church, mm-hmm. Pastor Jacob, Pastor Jason, Pastor Ryan, and Pastor Steve and their families. Mm-hmm. We ask for your blessings upon them. We pray, dear Father, for all the elders of this church. We ask that you also be there to guide them. Mm -hmm. We pray, dear Father, for the staff that work in this this church. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray for all of them and their families. Mm -hmm. May you guide them and bless them as they go about doing their work. Mm -hmm. And dear Father, we pray for all the families of HIF. We also pray that you're going to be guiding us. You're going to be protecting us all the time. Father, we, as we come here to to church today, we also want to remember this country, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We thank you so much, dear Father, that you allowed that at this moment, some of us would actually be here, even even though this is not our, 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 our own country but you have allowed that we should be here at this moment. Mm -hmm. And so, dear Father, we pray for this country. Mm -hmm. We want to pray for the leadership of this country. Mm -hmm. We know that you are the one who guides them as they go about their daily work. We want to pray for all the leaders from the top all the way to the bottom at the commune level, that you are going to be the one who guides their work, that you are going to bless them, and that you are going to continue to to protect them. Mm. Father, we want to pray for the people of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We want to pray for revival in this country, dear Father, so that the people of Vietnam can also come to accept your son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. And we know that this can only be possible Mm -hmm. if you purpose it to to happen in this country, dear Father. But it is something that happens Mm -hmm. through the leadership. And so that's why as a church, we Mm -hmm. want to pray that you guide the leaders of this country. Mm -hmm. We know, dear Father, that Vietnam, as all the other countries in the world, are going through the COVID pandemic. This has caused a lot of problems in Vietnam and in all the other places. Mm -hmm. Father, we want to thank you for preserving the peace and preserving the tranquility in this country because we know that the leadership have been really on top in Mm -hmm. trying to address this pandemic. Mm -hmm. But dear Father, we want to continue to ask you that you are going to continue working with the leaders of Vietnam to continue working so that this pandemic is going to be under control as it is. Mm -hmm. But we also know that in so many other places in the world, this problem is really big. It has caused a lot of harm to health. It has caused a lot of harm to livelihoods. And so dear Father, we pray for your presence in this. Mm -hmm. We know that as the Lord, you have all the information, you have perfect information regarding this. Mm -hmm. And we know that we can only count on you to get this pandemic behind us. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray that you're going to continue Mm -hmm. to be in our presence so that at your own appointed time, Mm -hmm. this pandemic can go away. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for today. Mm -hmm. We thank you that you have given us this privilege to come and to listen to your word. Mm -hmm. And as Pastor Jason is going to be preaching your word Mm -hmm. today, we want to ask you to be with him. Mm -hmm. We want to ask you to guide him so that he can preach your word to us. Mm -hmm. And dear Father, we also want to pray that you're going to open our hearts Mm -hmm. and our minds so that we can listen to the word that you have prepared for us today. We pray specifically that this word is going to preach to each one of us as individuals Mm. so that as we get out of this place, we are going to get something Mm. that is going to help us, to guide us in the way in which we should go 
so that we should live, li live our lives according to your will. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you so much for everything and we know that you are going to be with us mm -hmm. in this worship service. Holy Spirit, we invite you to preside over everything that is going to happen here mm -hmm. so that it will happen according to your will. Yes. Well, we have prayed all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah. Uh, I am Memory, Memory Chari, as Hadwig had already introduced himself. We are now going into offering. And before we go into offering, I would like to read some two verses from the Bible. I'll be reading from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 16. I'll be reading from verse 16 and verse 17. Verse 16. Three times a year all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. At the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of the tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. So, dear church, we are being encouraged to bring a gift as we are coming to the Lord. Even in our virtual meeting, we are still coming to meet the Lord. So we need to bring something. We are encouraged not to come empty-handed. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are coming before your throne of grace for offering. Thank you for the opportunity that we can bring this offer offering unto your throne of grace, that it can be used in the church, that it can be used even to serve other people that even do not know the church. But because your love is so great, you get to use the church even to reach to others. We have seen Jehovah God even before during the lockdown, during the COVID, even in this country in Vietnam, the church has been able to reach out to others because of the provisions of the various members of the church have provided. Father, we continue to pray that you bless each and every member of the church. We know there are others that their economic situations have Jehovah God suffered because of this COVID-19 or because of other reasons. But we pray for your grace. As we take a portion of what you've blessed us, and give it to you. May you also bless the resources that we have. May you bless those that do not have. May you bless those that apportion what they have and give it to you. Not because they have too much, but because they appreciate that you are the Lord that gives us. You are the Lord that is our provider. You are the Lord that is our protector. Therefore, God, we bring this offering unto you. We pray, Almighty Father, may you bless the offering. May you bless each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.
Hey, welcome everyone to our HIF online service. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Jason Fizard, the pastor here at Me Ding. If you're new, I'd love to meet you here at Me Ding whenever we open up again. Make sure to sign up for uh, the weekly updates at hif.vn. You can hit subscribe. For those at Me Ding, you know last week we started a new series, Race, Reconciliation, and the Gospel. We'll continue that once we return to our own locations. Uh, this last week was very exciting. Pastor Jakob and I had the privilege of going to one of our government offices offices to congratulate one of the top leaders on his new position uh, in another department. You'll be hearing more about this in the coming weeks, but I want to encourage us to keep praying for our government uh, offices that oversee all religious activity, not just our church, but the other uh, Protestant churches in Hanoi. And so before we begin looking at the Word of God, would you pray with me for our government leaders as we begin this morning? Wherever you are, with your friends, with your family, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to work with our government partners, building the relationship with them. We thank you for Mr. Tang and his uh, pr promotion and, and the opportunity we've had to build the relationship. Continue to pour out your favor on us. And now, Lord, as we open up your word, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit of God would have for us this morning. And now, Lord, we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Amen. Church, let's look at the Word of God this morning. When you hear the word church, what image or what picture comes to mind? Perhaps for you, it's more of kind of like a gas station image uh, where you go and fill up your spiritual tank. You come in empty on a Sunday and you get the spiritual fuel you need to make it through the next week. Or perhaps you think of the church like a movie theater, a place of entertainment, you know, an hour of escape. You come and hopefully you can be uh, sitting in a comfortable uh, chair and, you know, have some laughter and leave better off than when you came in. Maybe you think of the church kind of like a pharmacy store. You come in to fill your prescription, get the right dose of medicine to help you with your uh, pain and hurt. And, and for many, you see, the church is therapeutic. Or maybe you think of the church like a big retail store. Maybe the Big C, Media Mart, where I'm from, a Walmart or Costco. You know, it's that place to get all your uh, needed products and uh, pro, it's a, a one-stop shop for the program. That's kind of what the church is. It's the one-stop shop to get what you need. Many people see the church as just a producer of programs. You see, it can be very easily for us to distort the image and the picture and the mission of the church. How often when you hear the word church, do you think of family? This morning, I'm taking us through a Caring Family, a core value in our series, Together, Eight Habits of a Healthy Community. What we have written up for this core value, the elders have put down, a home away from home, HIF is a spiritual family that cares deeply for each other in the seasons of life. As Jesus said, we want to be known for our love for one another. Now, nearly all of us living in Vietnam, all of us foreigners, we are foreigners to this culture, to the city, to the life, to the uh, holidays, the traffic, everything. But we're not only foreigners, we're also removed from our families, our support structure, our relatives back home, the communities that we have grown up in. So it is a high priority for the elders that HIF is a home away from home. So however long you're in Hanoi, we want this to be your spiritual family. Now, for some of you hearing this, you may be saying, you know, Jason, spiritual family, really, isn't that a bit much? I mean, I'm okay with the idea of church, you know, coming on a Sunday every now and then. But, you know, this is strong personal language, this language of family. I'm not sure if I'm ready to make that kind of commitment. I'm a little more comfortable with just thinking of it as a church. Now, if that's you this morning, I'm glad you're listening, and I'm really happy and praying that after 30 minutes, you will think differently. 
The message today, I've just basically divided our core value into two parts. First, we're looking at HIF is a spiritual family. For those who are healthy and unsure on the, on the fence, what exactly does this mean? How does this fit into the mission and the vision of the church? If you're holding back some of your commitment, I want to show you the foundation for this in the New Testament. I want scripture to shape your understanding for a spiritual family. Secondly, if we are to be a spiritual family, what then should care look like for us? Let's get practical, very real and honest, and kind of assess and evaluate how care should look for us. Let's begin this morning. We're going to be looking at the writings from the Apostle Paul. Let's hear his answer. Paul, the great missionary and pastor, he planted churches across the Mediterranean world in the first century. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul here is writing to his young protege, Timothy. He has been mentored by Paul. Paul at this point has already written pretty much all of his letters. Galatians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians. He has, has, has years of wisdom under his belt and now he is passing it down to Timothy. And something here catches my attention. It's very profound for us. It gives us a window into Paul's understanding of the church. Look with me, verse 14 of chapter 3. Paul writes, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. Now, we'll stop here. Hopefully, he's wanting to visit Timothy. You see, about five years earlier, Paul, Acts 19, if you remember the story, he arrived in Ephesus. A riot broke out over his arrival. He left and would later return for three uh, flourishing years of ministry. And now Paul is writing near the end of his life. He's uh, uh, really a few years um, before his final imprisonment and his execution. And so he's written three chapters basically of wisdom and counsel to Timothy, warning him about false teachers, giving the qualifications for elders and instructions on prayer. And he writes here that he knew uh, he would see Timothy, but he's understanding that it may not happen. So he sends his teaching by letter in advance because, you see, Timothy can't wait. He needs the counsel. He needs advice from his mentor. And here he goes on explaining his mission, uh, the mission and the identity of the church. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to act in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Now, first, did you notice Paul cares about Christian conduct right there, how people ought to act. You see, to counter the false teaching of the day, Paul aims at truthful conduct in the church. He understood the saying, Actions speak louder than words. Yes, the church must care about doctrine and theology, but conduct matters. You see, Paul knew if the Ephesian Christians could behave as God wanted them to live, then they would silence the false teachers around them. That's going to be the second half of our message, looking at our conduct. How do we care for one another? But first, back to the mission and the identity of the church. What caught my attention, God's household. Why did Paul add this? Uh, think about it. If I was sitting down with Paul, I would ask him this. Paul, it would have been much easier to say, I have written so that you will know how people ought to act in the church of the living God. It would have been much straightforward, more direct. It would be a lot clearer. Paul, why add God's household? Enter with me into the mind of Paul, the great theologian. Let me ask you, what do you think of when you hear the word house or household? Maybe you think of the color of the house, the number of rooms, the furniture inside. Those are kind of peripheral things, but essentially a family lives in a house. You see, a household has individuals. It is made up of people. And so Paul here is giving analogy of a household that refers to the church as God's family. And when you read the New Testament, Paul writ, wrote roughly one half of it. He formed and shaped the early communities of Jesus followers with family language. 
If we could get in a time machine and go back to the first century there in Philippi or Ephesus and we heard the gospel and we believed the message, how would we begin to understand ourselves? How would we view ourselves? We would perceive ourselves as a family. For example, look at how Paul wrote to these early communities. For example, the people in Colossae, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Over a hundred times in the New Testament, we see the language of brothers and sisters. This is how Paul formed Christian community. And notice with me, who's the head? God the Father. The first person of the Trinity, God the Father. This is the family language in the New Testament. It flows out of the Trinitarian God. As you know, within the Trinity, we have God the Father, God the Son, family language. Love between the Father and the Son through the Spirit displays the intimacy of relational love. And this is what we saw in John 13 to 17, that insider look into the Trinity. Paul is using the language of household. Literally, it means the family of God showing how the mission, the identity of the church flows out of the very nature of our triune God. God is a relationship. Now, Paul is teaching that Timothy must sharply distinguish Christians from the wider society because you're either in the family or you're not in the family of God. Now, jump with me to other passages from Paul where we see the identity of the church, how he shaped it by using family language. Now, what's interesting is when Paul wrote to the churches, do you know he never called himself pastor? That's shocking because he had all the credentials, he had the experience, he had the education, and he never referred to himself as pastor. How did he form community in God's household? using parenting language and parenting metaphors. Nine times he refers to himself as a father. For example, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Or for example, to the Thessalonians, as you know, we dealt with each of you like a father with his children. We encouraged, we comforted, and we implored each one of you to walk worthy of God. And get this, also three times Paul refers to himself as mother. One of these examples, Galatians 4. My children, I am again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. Right? Only a mother experiences the pains of labor. Are you beginning to see, church, the tender, intimate, relational family language Paul used to shape Christian identity in the church? And you see, often as Christians, we think of our faith as just kind of Jesus and me, especially if you're from the West where we're very individualistic. We kind of think, you know, if I'm growing in my faith, well, that's all that matters. But here's the thing. Paul wasn't concerned only with the conversion of individuals, but with the formation of discipling communities. Let me ask you, is this your concern when you walk into church on a Sunday morning? And for the week, Monday to Saturday, is this how you think about the mission and the identity of the church? You see, church is more than an organization and an institution. It is more than a gathering a space in a rented building here in the 17th floor of DTAC or in the Hanoi Club. The church, first and foremost, is a spiritual family and how we care for one another must reflect this reality. And praise the Lord, I see this at HIF, and I know you do too. I'm so grateful and thankful to be a part of this church community, to serve alongside you. Church, I love you dearly, but don't you want this family bond to grow deeper and deeper? Don't you want our hearts to be knit closer together? I mean, think of it this way. It would be kind of silly in our uh, biological families, you know, if mom and dad one time came to the kids and said, you know what, kids, I think you're loving one another too much. Can you just kind of tone it back? Or the kids would say to the parents, you know, mom and dad, you just shower us with so much grace. You're kind of overdoing, overdoing it. Could you tone it down a little bit? 
That would be silly. Absolutely not. And so how much more in this spiritual family do we desire God to knit our hearts together? As Paul prayed, may your love abound more and more. Now, maybe you're wondering, Jason, how do I get into this family? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because Paul, the master of metaphors with heartfelt language, he introduces this idea of adoption. Adoption is when you take someone biologically not in your family and you legally make them your own, bringing them into your family. And language of adoption, it is the heart of the gospel. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 1. He predestined us for adoption of sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. No other New Testament writer uses the language of adoption. It is unique to Paul. Five times he uses the language of adoption. Now, what was your status before adoption? You were a slave to sin. You were living under the power of darkness, Colossians 1. You were children of the devil, 1 John chapter 3. You were by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2. But what happens when we experience what Jesus said to Nicodemus, you will be, you must be born again. It's kind of like the picture I have in mind is that we're standing at the door of God, the father standing right before the one we have betrayed, rebelled, rejected. And we're standing there. If you picture this in your mind's eye, empty handed, guilty, ashamed, heartbroken, full of sin and despair, desperate and needy. There's nothing of our own merit or worth. There's, there's no reason why God should take us back. And there we are when we confess and repent, God, the father forgives us. And wouldn't that be enough, right? To get the forgiveness of God, the creator. I mean, we can be grateful for that, but guess what God, the father does. He opens the door and he stands back and he pushes the door and he says, my son, my daughter, I welcome you into the family. What is mine is now yours. And there's no reason that God should have loved us. But in Christ, church, he set his love upon us and he has adopted us into his family. This is why J.I. Packer, one of the greatest theologians of the last century, he just passed away. He said, adoption is the highest privilege the gospel offers. And I agree with that statement. How true is that? How often do you consider this great and glorious exchange? Are you daily discovering the joy of having the full rights and access and privilege of being a member of God's household? And guess what? Paul would say it's even better than this. It gets better. You see, adopted sons and daughters, we now get the new language of the family of God. Look with me, Romans 8. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. This is remarkable. You see, church, when we address God, Abba, Father, in the way that Jesus addressed God, the Father, that is evidence that the Spirit of God has taken up residence in our lives. And God, the Father, continues to pour out his Spirit on his children. So we continually experience the warm embrace of being in God's household, and we can then share that with other family members. How is the Lord challenging you this week to live out your identity as a member of God's household? You know, and I think some of us listening, I'm going to guess that some of you may feel like a homeless Christian. Homeless. Because for perhaps months or even years, you have not stepped into the family of God. You have removed yourself from the family of God. You've maybe distanced yourself. For months or even years, you have been living in the world and you have been left disillusioned, discouraged, and defeated. And I want to encourage you this morning to come back to the family of God. Brothers and sisters in this church, or at your, if you're at another church, we will welcome you back. There is no shame. There is no guilt. There is no judgment. Come back and experience the fullness of who you are in Christ as a member of God's household. 
Now back to Paul and Timothy. He has given the mission of the church around God's household. Moving on now, he says, secondly, the church of the living God. Now our God is working among his people. Amen? Pandemic or no pandemic, the presence of God is alive and active among his people. This is a central covenant promise of the Bible, going back to the Old Testament where he said, I will live among them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, this is one reason why the church is different from every other human organization or institution because we are not bound by a physical space but the church of the living god is the place where the spirit of god lives ephesians 2 next we see here the mission the identity of the church we see the pillar and the foundation of truth do you see paul is moving from family imagery now into kind of architectural building imagery and we could say the life and the health of the church as a spiritual family, it must be built on the foundation of the gospel. There is no other foundation. Now, don't misunderstand this. The church is not the source of truth. We do not create truth. Rather, we witness to the truth. The church becomes the foundation for the truth to stand. Now, in a postmodern world today, absolute truth is not widely accepted. Uh, the world operates off of relative truth. Whatever is true for me may not be true for you. I, re I read one survey uh, in America this year. They discovered that 58% of people believe that truth depends on what they believe. So whatever's true for them doesn't have to be true for someone else. And what's shockingly sad is that they discovered that Christians who believe the Bible, 46% reject the idea of absolute moral truth. Church, we cannot forsake the task of displaying the absolute truth of God's love, justice, and mercy found in Jesus Christ. And this is why Paul is concerned about how believers must behave. Going back to what we saw, so that you will know how people ought to act, how to behave. You see, in the first century or in the 21st century, talk is cheap. If our lives are no different from others around us, if the gospel has no impact on the way we care for one another or handle our money or think about suffering and trials or how we decide right and wrong, how we raise our children, why should anyone believe what we have to say? And now we begin the second half of the message because now we must look at, okay, how then do we care for one another. We've established that the church is a spiritual family. And so now, how do we care for one another to reflect this mission of the church? Look with me to Paul again. We're going to see how, how Paul gives kind of four aspects of caring for one another. Now, let me just be up front before I go on. I am preaching to myself here. I am up here not because I have mastered these things, but I am growing. I am learning just like you how to care. First, we see care is purposefully devoted. Romans 12, show family affection to one another with brotherly love. The NIV says be devoted. We approach one another purposefully planned, prioritizing others. We do not just think about care, but we do it. And here's the thing. As people, church, I know that we know all about what it means to be devoted. For example, we are people who are devoted to diets. You know, we are devoted to healthy cooking and carefully picking our ingredients that we use. We, we are careful with how we plan menus and, and feed our children. We commit to this daily because we are devoted. Or for example, I mean, we are people devoted to sports teams. I mean, if you watch a game, you see people, you know, crazy jumping around and their faces are painted. They're devoted and, and we move our schedules. So we watch that game. We're devoted to following the team throughout the year. Or we're devoted to hobbies, biking and swimming or, or learning an instrument. We're eager and enthusiastic to, to grow in that discipline. For me, for many years, I was devoted to surfing. For me, when the waves were good in Southern California, I would move my schedule around and make time to be out in the ocean chasing the perfect waves. I remember 
Uh, my first few weeks of marriage um, in Southern California, the one Saturday, the waves were very good, and I, you know, said goodbye to Jill that morning with a friend to go out to the ocean, and she probably thought, you know, Jason's just going to be gone for an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and there the waves were perfect, and about six hours later, I came back, and to her surprise, she was shocked, a little discouraged, very surprised, and I learned the hard way that marriage would cause me to reorder my priorities and devotion. You see, as people, we are devoted. And Paul says, dear Christian, now it's time to turn that devotion outwards, being purposefully devoted to others. And here's the thing. The New Testament repeats this exhortation countless times. Why? Because it is not easy and natural. We naturally gravitate to being devoted to ourselves and the things that we enjoy. So when you walk into church on a Sunday morning, how can you be purposefully devoted to one another? Well, one way to start is genuinely ask how people are doing. Listen to what they say and then look for ways to act. And go through the week saying, Lord, I want to be ready to meet people practically. Or maybe in the week you can follow up with other brothers and sisters and say, hey, are you sick? How can I help you? Can I send food? Can I deliver something for you? When someone shares a prayer request, you can follow up with them. Secondly, care is grace driven. Colossians 4, your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Now, Paul here is talking to how we speak with non-believers, but shouldn't we speak this way full of grace to our own family members? And the idea here of seasoning the food with salt, uh, you know, salt enhances the flavor. And so it is when we add grace, it enhances our fellowship. It kind of brings out the richness and the attractiveness of our speech. Now, what's true about our biological families is that often those that we love, those we are closest to and care most about, we can often be most careless with our words and hurt them. That's why we go to counselors to get help and to heal the wounds that we have from our own family. And so it is, though, in our spiritual family church, there are people in our community that have been hurt by maybe another church, a church member, or a family member. And because of that, maybe you're afraid of expressing your uh, feelings. You have a fear of rejection. Maybe you don't know how to receive care. And maybe you grew up in a home where affection was never given. So it's easier for you to keep a distance and not be vulnerable with anyone. You see, grace-driven care that is infused into a community, what it does is it brings the heart of Jesus in the here and now of everyday life. And what happens is we begin to lower our defenses. We begin to lower our guards. And we begin to see healing and restoration in those that are hurting. What would it look like for you this week if you went to the person that hurt you last week or last month and you gave them grace, what they don't deserve, and you forgave them. And you infused grace into that relationship, undeserved kindness. Or, or maybe learning to walk with that person in your life who is struggling and making some bad decisions. And, and you suspend your judgment and your criticism. And, and you just saturated your words with grace and encouraged them on their journey. Isn't it true that a little salt goes a long way in food? And how true it is that just a little bit of grace goes a long way in our relationships with one another. Third, care is Christ-centered. Philippians, if you remember from our study of this book, Paul says in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So to the Philippian church, Paul is forming and shaping community in the relational life. As believers, he's looking at the life-on-life -life aspect of gospel partnerships and what unites and strengthens the people of God. It's when we take the same frame of mind that is of Jesus Christ. 
And here's the problem. Then and today, disunity and division is a part of the family of God. It happens because of selfish attitudes and desires and desire for recognition. That can destroy unity in the church. And what is Paul's remedy? Take the mind of Christ. Now you're hearing this maybe thinking, you know, Jason, this kind of sounds theoretical, but how is this Christ-centered care? Well, Christ-centered care, it is going to be marked by humility, the humility that we see in Christ. And here's the danger that we need to be careful about, church. As Christians, we can often adopt secular psychology and methodology from self-help. And we just say, you know what, that's just the way I am. I'm just, you know, I can't control my desires my attitudes or uh, actions. I'm just going to kind of stand firm in my pride because this is the way I am. And the Apostle Paul would say to us, there is no place for that thinking with spirit-filled Christians because we are not a slave to our attitudes and inclinations. The Spirit of God in us gives us the mind of Christ and we begin to be marked with humility. And so, Christ-centered care, it overcomes the conflict that divides with humility that heals and restores and comforts the faint-hearted. In our spiritual family, I challenge us, what is Christ-centered care going to sound like on a Sunday or in the week when we interact? I think it will sound like conversation that is marked by, hey, have I heard you? Have I hurt you? Have I done anything wrong? If so, please forgive me. Or I'm sorry, I made that mistake. It wasn't my intention. Will you pray for me? Or maybe when we're giving counsel and advice to one another, we say things like, hey, have you approached that person and asked them for forgiveness to be reconciled? You see, Christ-centered care cares about peacemaking. In the family of God, unity is a priority. Lastly, how do we care deeply for one another? As we embody and are committed to, purposefully, devoted, grace-driven, Christ-centered, and now finishing up redemptive care. You see, church, God has designed our salvation so that we never, we never outgrow our need for our spiritual family. I could say it this way, like it or not, we are stuck together in a good way. In fact, church, the fullness of our redemption, it involves a dependency on one another. The truth is we are needy and we are needed. Brothers and sisters, we are needy people. We have hurts, we have hang-ups, we have worries, we have sadness from losing loved ones, we have troubles that overwhelm us, we have sin that continually threatens our lives, and we feel broken, and, and as a result, we feel inadequate to help other people. But friends, weakness and neediness, this is a valuable asset in the family of God. Because receiving care, this moves us along in our redemption. And brothers and sisters, you are needed. You are meant to walk along side by side with other brothers and sisters. And when we finish the race of faith and we look around there at the finish line, we will not be standing alone. We will be together. And God desires to redeem us and to change us as he uses his sons and daughters, people who have been recreated in Christ, empowered by the Spirit, to be marked day by day by the love that Jesus said, you will be known by your love for one another. And so church, we are a spiritual family. And may the Lord powerfully and mightily work in us so that we are compelled to have purposefully devoted, grace-driven, Christ-centered, redemptive care for one another. Would you pray with me? Lord, do not let us as your people be discouraged by COVID because you have given us a vision, a mission, a purpose to love each other in such a radical way that the world will know that we are different. 
We pray this for our church community here. We pray this for our brothers and sisters in this country that we love dearly. That what we desire for our family to be healthy, whole, and be redeemed and growing in these ways, we pray this for the churches in this city, across this country, throughout Southeast Asia, and for the global church. Do, Lord, what only you can do in your people and give us open hearts ready to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. You've come to bring peace, to be loved, to be nearer to us, and you've come to bring light, to be light, to shine brighter in us. Hey, thanks for being with us for HIF Online. And if we're still online next week, Pastor Ryan's going to be bringing a message called Welcome and Launch about our process of welcoming people into HIF and hopefully the kingdom of God, and then sending them out, launching them out into their next place so that we can pray over them and uh, wish them well. But for right now, I'd like to ask you a question about your sermon. You, yeah. I was really intrigued by this idea that you put forth of a, uh, you called it a homeless Christian. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, my mind instantly went to that great parable of Jesus. Mm -hmm. When you talked about the, the prodigal son, and after he had been a homeless Christian, yeah. maybe, yeah. 
He came back. He was worried that the father wouldn't accept him. And the father just goes running to him, gives him his signet ring and a cloak, mm-hmm. and kills the fatted calf. And I was wondering, what would you say to someone who uh, might right now yeah. be a, a homeless yeah. Christian? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the good news of the gospel is that when we wander away and when we have seasons of being a prodigal son or daughter and uh, walking away from the family of God, that that doesn't change the truths about us that we are still hidden in Christ. So I would say to anyone in that situation is that uh, you are welcomed back into the community, the family of God. There's no shame. We want to encourage you, love you, support you, and help you live to your full potential in Christ. So please, uh, we look forward to seeing you on on a Sunday. Uh, let me give us the benediction for this Sunday from the Apostle Paul in Romans 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards one another, so that you may accept one another with one mind and one voice to the praise of Christ Jesus. Accept one another as Christ Jesus has accepted you to the praise of God. Go in the grace of God this week and the power of the Holy Spirit. See you next Sunday.